it's with great pleasure to introduce uh, Jasper Feinjach, if I hope I, I manage well, who is an associate professor at the, um, at the Ghent University and, and a researcher at the Center of Contextual Psychiatry in Leuven, um, who will talk today about something I think that he has been a very, very central in psychiatry. And he will use all his experience first as a clinical psychologist and then as a, also as a philosopher. So combining these two streams of knowledge into a, a what is the core of psychiatry indeed, uh, or, the, or the mental health or, or, or our specialities? Uh, what, is a, what is a delusion? That has been the key question for years and, and we never managed to have a, a unique, sincere uh, definition of this. Um, so uh, there are two magnificent uh, studies or publications recently about that. So if you can have time also to read that later, that will be great. Um, he also have a lovely, uh, Twitter account, so I recommend you to continue and to follow him because there are a lot of interesting um, tweets there, but also an uh, interesting uh, call for an, um, a new journal, for a special issue in the Journal of Psych Psychological, uh, sorry, Philosophical Research, but probably he will also talk us later. Okay, Jasper, thank you very much. Your The floor is yours. Thank you so much. So, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me to this seminar series and to talk about my research. Uh, so, in particular, I will focus on um, two recent papers on the subject of delusions in schizophrenia, uh, which were both uh, published uh, in Lancet Psychiatry last year. So, the first one, uh, Delusions Beyond Beliefs, is a review paper in which we offered a critical overview of uh, diagnostic, explanatory, and therapeutic uh, delusion research of the past few decades from a clinical phenomenological perspective. The second one, uncovering the realities of delusional experience, um, yeah, could be considered as a sort of empirical uh, follow-up paper to the review and in which we investigated in a qualitative a phenomenological way, uh, certain characteristics of delusional reality experience of which we argued in the review, that they are crucial to understand delusions, but nonetheless are often neglected in contemporary research. So to give an overview of these two papers, I will engage with the general question that transpires uh, throughout both of them, namely, what is a delusion? Or uh, how should we understand delusions? So along the way, I will discuss a selection of our empirical findings, how these findings could be relevant for diagnostic discussions regarding, for example, the categorical or uh, continuous nature of psychosis, for neurocognitive explanatory research on how delusions are formed and maintained, and finally, for um, the evaluation of current uh, treatment approaches and for the development of new interventions. So I hope that sounds interesting and plenty enough for your uh, lunch meeting. So as I mentioned, the general question that uh, inspired these two studies is that of understanding the nature of delusion and what specific kind of psychological phenomenon we are dealing with uh, in case of delusions. Yet this question is also a fairly uh, classical one, uh, one that resurfaces every so often in um, throughout the history of our discipline. And which it is fair to say uh, has also caused a substantial amount of uh, confusion and of headaches uh, with anyone actually who has tried to uh, engage with this question. Now this headache has everything to do with the fact that delusions uh, present us with a fascinating and for that very reason uh, also uh, notoriously difficult uh, to understand phenomena. So to have a start, what are we to make, for example, of uh, the following delusional statements quoted by Karol Jaspers in his uh, general psychopathology? I quote, other people in the world are merely machines devoid of human consciousness. When I close my eyes, they cease to exist. The entire universe is on the verge of dissolution. All clots on this earth follow my own heartbeat. 
When my eyes get bright blue, the sky also turns blue. Now, one of the difficult questions here is that of understanding how people can arrive at such bizarre convictions. So for example, for, example, for those that are fond of cognitive explanations, the question is how many biases or reasoning errors we have to assume in order to explain such statements, given that they do not seem to involve any minor deviation of ordinary judgments. And if we indeed do assume such a massive presence of inferential errors, how could we reconcile such massive irrationality with the fact that these people with respect to other domains of their life seemingly possess perfectly rational and coherent beliefs? Is there something like a local and restricted lockdown of rationality? And furthermore, how do we have to deal with this in clinical practice? Uh, where do we even start to convince these people that the universe is totally oblivious to their internal going ons? And why do these people seem impervious to what is entirely obvious for anyone else? So these and other similar sorts of questions soon confront us with the limits of our empathic understanding. And for this reason, some classical authors even propose this limit as a diagnostic criterion for delusion and for schizophrenia more generally. So the Dutch psychiatrist Rumke, for example, talked about the so-called Precortsgefühl or Precort feeling, which would arise in confrontation with individuals with schizophrenia. This, so this involves a feeling of strangeness or of intersubjective impenetrability that emphasizes this limit. Carol Jaspers underscored in a similar way the essential incomprehensibility of what he called true or primary delusions. So in contrast with secondary delusions, which for Jaspers were psychologically understandable as exaggerations of ordinary experience and psychological reactions. So Jaspers described his distinction as, and I quote, the most profound distinction in psychic life as that between what is meaningful and allows empathy and what in its particular way is ununderstandable, mad in the literal sense. Now, these sort of terms and discussions that put emphasis on the patent strangeness of delusions and on their difference from the realm of ordinary experience have largely disappeared from contemporary research for some time now. And today, and this was also one of the starting observations of our uh, papers, we find an entirely different uh, conception of delusion and of the sort of questions it provokes. So in current research, delusion is even often considered to offer a less ambiguous and more straightforward uh, grounds for, for example, diagnostic research than the more contested concept like schizophrenia. So according to the current view, delusions are simply false beliefs which are often stubbornly upheld, but which for the rest are not really that special or, or exceptional. So everybody is susceptible from time to time to strange or false ideas about uh, which others would raise their eyebrows. So think again of the currently widespread corona and vaccination skepticism. So this democratic idea is, for example, central in the so-called psychosis continuum approach that we find promoted in the work of, for example, Jim Van Os and others. So on this view, Delusions and delusion-like experience are much more common than often and previously thought. Delusions are merely quantitative extremes of the ordinary false beliefs that we find everywhere in the general population. This idea, of course, has also in turn implications for how we try to explain delusions. So the idea is here that people are simply not optimal epistemic agents, we are all confronted with reasoning errors, we jump to conclusions on, to, on the basis of too few evidence, and are often reluctant to rectify our beliefs when we are confronted with contrary evidence. So the continuity between ordinary irrationality and psychotic delusions 
is the grounding assumption of cognitive theories which attempt to explain delusions as a result of numerous biases. Think, for example, uh, about the famous jumping to conclusions bias. Finally, the idea also has implications for how we approach delusions in uh, psychotherapeutic treatments. So especially the second generation of cognitive behavioral interventions have emphasized cognitive challenging, Socratic questioning, or the shared search for better and more functional beliefs to replace delusions as therapeutic strategies. Now, the second goal of our paper of our papers was not merely to offer a critique of these uh, approaches, but to show how a different conception of uh, delusion could possibly help in addressing some of the problems that are present in these domains of research. So, for example, research demonstrates that cognitive models that start from the false belief conception of delusion suffer from a lack of convincing results. So meta-analysis on the jumping to conclusions bias do not find conclusive evidence uh, for a specific link with delusions. Similarly, in uh, psychological therapies for delusions that are informed by the false belief conception are less effective than we would like. So meta-analysis here on the efficacy of CBT for psychosis show effect sizes that are uniformly in the low range, and these results are even less favorable for delusions specifically. So, as I mentioned already, for this alternative approach, we drew on the phenomenological tradition of which Carl Jaspers was also one of the founding figures, which we can find today in the work of researchers like Louis Sass, uh, Joseph Parnas, or Thomas Fuchs. And in the phenomenological approach, delusions are not so much considered as ordinary irrational beliefs, but rather as expressions of experiences that arise within an entirely different framework of experience. So from a phenomenological perspective, Delusions are the results of more fundamental changes in how certain basic dimensions of experience of existence, namely the self, others, time, reality, are experienced by patients. So this alternative view can also be gleaned from Jasper's uh, critical reaction to the standard formula of delusion as a mistaken idea. And I quote here, to say simply that illusion is a mistaken idea which is firmly held by the patients and which cannot be corrected gives only a superficial and incorrect answer to the problem. Instead, Jaspers held, and I quote, delusion proper implies a transformation in our total awareness of reality. And elsewhere, reality for the patient does not always carry the same meaning as that of normal reality. Now to give a clearer idea of this phenomenological approach and of what this sort of transformation of our total awareness of reality actually can involve, I will draw on the results of our qualitative study and use pseudonymized quotes to illustrate our findings. So first of all, it is important to note that patients themselves often emphasize how different, or if you like, discontinuous delusional experience is when compared to their ordinary experience of reality. And patients in our study remarked that delusions are not about limited or restricted changes in the contents of their beliefs or perceptions, but that they rather involve a more fundamental and encompassing reorganization of their overall reality. I quote, my psychosis was a total experience. It was not merely my beliefs or thoughts that changed, but also my behavior, my feeling. It was a complete and total form of experiencing. This global and atmospheric change often announced an unprecedented shift in patients' relation to reality, as if somehow a new ontological domain suddenly opened up. I quote, it was as if I suddenly gained a new form of consciousness 
that I discovered a different sort of world which others couldn't understand. Another quote, in one single instance, everything was totally different. I found myself in an entirely different world. Now, the specific sense in which this newly gained reality differs from everyday reality can be observed to differ between participants. For some patients, this new reality does not seem to be that ordinary neutral counterpart that has an essential autonomy and an uh, objective independence, but is rather experienced as something which is somehow dependent on their subjective perception of it. So for that reason, delusional reality can come across as something that seems artificial, as fabricated or constructed, or can appear as a bad copy of a more true or authentic reality that is located somewhere else. One of our patients, Julia, aptly described a kind of hypo-reality, so a reality that appears to be less real than the ordinary one and which she likens to the reality depicted in the American movie, The Truman Show. So like in that film, it was as if nothing in particular had changed and everything just seemingly ran its ordinary course, yet everything nonetheless appeared in a strangely artificial or even cinematic light. I quote, I thought it was all a film and that I was only a small pawn within that film. The same patient, Julia, also noted how also other people became part of this hyperreal degradation of reality, as if they lost their objective autonomy as real human beings, and instead offered the impression of merely putting on a show, of being only actors, or even of only playing at being real fellow human beings. I quote, I was in a sort of dream world. And when I looked at the medical staff, they were just sitting there as some sort of machines. And they only seemed to move when I looked at them. Julia furthermore, Julia furthermore emphasized how not only other people, but almost everything took on a similarly arranged or constructed quality, as if it was purposefully placed there to test her and to measure her reaction. I quote, for me, everything was fake and photoshopped or consciously placed there for some indefinite reason. And if I saw a painting by one of my favorite artists, I would have considered that very suspicious. Like, how do you know that this is my favorite artist? I would have thought that it was strategically placed there to attack me or to pull me over in some way or another. Other patients also described that within this hyperreality, what other people do and why they do what they do can become the focus of a sort of hyper-reflexive and questioning consciousness. As a, as a result, patients often become observers of life, pause and reflect over all ordinarily taken for granted customs, which now appear strange and entirely superfluous. So for example, why do people shake hands how long do you have to do this? And aren't people aware that this activity is totally unnecessary? In the same vein, one patient talked about his detached per perspective on the apparently banal practice of small talk about the weather. I quote, but okay, the weather, if people start talking about the weather, then you start checking the language. What do you mean by good weather? There are clouds, do you think that's part of good weather? The way, the way you relate to others changes when you're constantly questioning everything instead of simply living in the, in the movements. So within this sort of hyper-reflexive experiential stance, the delusional individual obtains an entirely new and in his own experience, sometimes an even more truthful perspective on the reality that is simply accepted without question by other people. So on the one hand, this can have an alienating effect. Everything which was self-evident before now appears as doubtful. Everything which was without question suddenly appears as groundless and without any necessity. I quote, everything loses its familiarity. The predictability was completely gone. The king could have entered my room, so to speak, and I would have found that normal. 
I wouldn't have been surprised at all. And I would have said, see, I told you so. On the other hand, this can also have a liberating effect. What formerly presented itself as reality now becomes only one option amongst many. That things are what they are is now simply a temporary face in a much larger spectrum of possibilities. New connections emerge, different perspectives on the nature of time, of consciousness, freedom, and embodiment. These things have lost their former self-evidence, but for that very reason, they can also appear more salient, sharper, and more lucid as ever. We observed, for example, that other participants reported changes in reality experience, which we classified as hyper-real. So in contrast to the discussed hypo-real experiences. So in contrast to hypo-reality, hyper-reality seems to be permeated by a global atmosphere of necessity, of compulsion, and of heightened meaningfulness. Participants described how everything suddenly gains a seemingly inevitable uh, and deeper significance, as if nothing merely happens and mere facticity and coincidence cease to exist as viable experiential possibilities. I quote, sometimes I can open my Bible and just pick up all the facts. Everything makes sense. Everything makes absolute sense. And then I tell myself, what a coincidence. But after a while, it's really frightening, all those insights. You keep on saying, what a coincidence. So the, this loss of coincidence and of the sheer facticity of things changes the overall sense of reality. So normally, salient meanings emerge against a neutral background of insignificance, but now nearly everything seems to be imposing itself in the foreground, demanding immediate attention. This generalized salience gives the hyperreal world an aura of unavoidability and of heightened intensity. I quote, it is really a more compelling, a much too compelling reality, much more compelling than ordinary reality. Participants furthermore emphasized that this revelation of the utter necessity of things evokes awe, astonishment, and feelings of holiness of having been graced with insight into the deeper layers or structures of reality. Participants particularly emphasized that this was not merely a matter of intellectual contemplation, but that it involved a more fundamental experiential shift in which the self versus world distinction seemed to temporarily dissolve in a blissful state of higher unity or even mystical wholeness. I quote, the light led me all in a fluid movement, very strange. I often read in psychiatric textbooks that psychosis is a matter of chaotic impressions and of confusion, but I wasn't confused at all. Everything was one fluent, pleasurable movement of utter consistency. Everything made sense. Another quote. My feeling was totally different from normal. It was a state of euphoria in which I lived a feeling of overflowing with the sort of universal love, a feeling of fullness. It is really a bliss to be able to experience that. So common to all participants' accounts were feelings of centrality or of having oneself an exceptional position within hyperreality. Quote, normal reality is indifferent towards you, but this reality makes you special. For some, however, this exceptional feeling could also get a threatening quality with ominous, paranoid feelings of being watched or followed by a source they were unable to locate in ordinary three-dimensional space. I quote, you're incapable of grasping them. I think they're made of a different consistency, not matter, but anti-matter, like they're located in a different domain of reality. Another quote, I just knew I was being watched by a source, a source behind the curtain. So this as a sort of selection of uh, themes. So to summarize, the phenomenological approach of delusion emphasizes the entire uh, distinctive experiential context within which delusions are experienced. So for outsiders, 
for those who do not find themselves within such a context and accordingly judge a delusion from the perspective of common sense or everyday reality, a delusion undoubtedly appears as an unfounded and irrational belief. Yet within that context, for those who find themselves confronted with these ontological transformations and alterations of self-consciousness, a delusion offers expression to fundamental changes in the basic dimensions of experience and in which time, space, others and self-consciousness appear in a qualitatively different way. Now to conclude my talk, this updated phenomenological conception of delusion has several consequences for how we should approach delusions in each of the three domains of research, which I briefly discussed before. First of all, with respect to, uh, to the discussion regarding the dimensional or categorical, categorical nature of psychosis, the phenomenological conception offers us different criteria to look at this supposed continuum. So if delusions are not merely quantitative extensions of ordinary false beliefs, this changes, for example, the conclusions we can draw from large-scale epidemiological research that precisely starts from such a limited conception. So this limited conception is the reason, for example, why belief in ghosts in the general population have been cited in support of the continuum claim. And I think the lesson for this kind of research is that the vaguer or less phenomenologically specific and detailed way a phenomenon is described and researched, the more likely it is, of course, that we will find that phenomenon in the general population through big M epidemiological research. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that I'm only critical for this kind of approach. I underwrite, for example, the ethical inspiration which lies at its origin and which is inclusive and normalizing. Yet I also believe that the same ethical inspiration can be achieved without necessarily reducing everything to a same continuum. Second, in explanatory research, the phenomenological con conception also changes what we set out to explain. And here explaining delusions will not so much be about cognitive biases or inferential errors, but rather a search for more low level processes that are involved in our most basic experience of reality. Think for example, about the fact that we are embodied agents who move around and are involved in all sorts of activities. And that this agential perspective largely determines how reality appears to us. By contrast, by contrast, if we statically fixate long enough on the determinate points in our field of awareness, this also seems to reduce our sense of reality. More generally, in explanatory research, the phenomenological approach of delusion calls for a shift of focus away from cognitive processes that are involved in the correct representations or judgments about reality, to those processes that are involved in the buildup of a basic and stable experience of reality. It is only on that basis that adequate or inadequate judgments are able to arise. In therapeutic research, finally, it also offers a different kind of approach. So if delusions are better understood as the results of a global shift in reality experience, then therapy, rather than attempting to cognitively challenge delusions or to ask patients to reconsider the evidence, should focus on those processes and factors that, that contribute to such a shift, or conversely, that facilitate a coherent experience of everyday reality. Here we could think, for example, about how the immersion in daily and meaningful activities strengthens or strengthen our involvement with and the self-evidence of everyday reality. Also think about the importance of social contacts, of sharing things with each other as an important condition to be able to experience a shared reality. However, beyond the strict mental health perspective, our phenomenological findings also highlight the more existential value delusions can have for some individuals. Some patients do not, do not always seem to experience the acquired detachment from everyday reality as a deficit or affliction, 
but sometimes also as a transformative experience that changes their overall orientation in life in a profound and permanent way. I quote, I would never tell this to my psychiatrists, but it, because I fear they would look at me in a wrong way. But indeed, it has changed me profoundly. Another quote, life after psychosis is poor and meaningless. Everything that was so elevated and so full of meaning loses that meaning after psychosis. I notice that my friends who had similar experiences keep on struggling with existential questions, and it is a daily struggle. So this existential dimension of delusions also affect the perspective of patients on what constitutes meaningful therapy. Some patients seem to be dissatisfied with therapeutic tips regarding stress management or similar sorts of pragmatic advice that is focused on the reduction of symptoms and on everyday concerns. I quote, I have done all sorts of therapy and I found that it often offers common or garden tips in order to manage yourself. But that really doesn't suffice. You need to get insight into what happens into the entire story that unrolls. So what seems to be required here are approaches that are able to acknowledge and to discuss in an open and non-normative way how delusions can impact the experience of the most fundamental categories of human existence, namely the nature of life, of meaning, of truth, and an awareness that addressing these issues goes beyond what can be dealt with from a strict mental health perspective. Hello, thank you for your attention. Thank you to you for your for the talk, which was excellent, I respected.